appreciate that. What an honor to be here tonight and share a little bit with you about what we do and how God has given us the grace to do it. And uh, I want to say thank you to uh, my friend Ryan, y'all's pastor. Uh, yeah, he, he, I travel, I mean, I travel all over the world, but here in the United States, um, the pool of solid pastors kind of shrunk around 2020, <laughs> where you find out what people were really made of, and I'm not talking about best decisions under, I'm just talking about godly men in positions of leadership with a backbone. And uh, in no way should Christians have ever succumbed to the government telling us when and where we can't worship God Almighty. Uh, I lost a lot of so-called friends during that time period, and, uh, and I cleaned out my library. I remember going, nope. <laughs> Nope, definitely nope. <laughs> and I say that all just to remind you of what a great blessing you have in your senior pastor and his family to, to serve you guys. Uh, uh, when we travel and do what we do, we, we carry blades. Uh, this is a signature blade that we, we carry with us because it's it opens letters all over the world. <laughs> it's just anyway I want to give this to you Ryan. This is what we carry overseas. Please uh <laughs> it's the the pointy end is where it's dangerous. How to say that for Army. That's all right. As a Marine, he'll give me some crayons in the back. Like, thank you. Well, you want to meet my dog? Yeah. Hey, Scout, come on up. Come on. Get up here. This is Scout. She's very sweet, tender heart, loves to bite people. <laughs> Look at this, she actually has a stainless steel canine. That's when we have to go in the hood. <laughs> So Scout's one of the few dogs that's actually faced ISIS fighters with us. Uh, not in military terms, but missionaries. We're high-risk missionaries. So you have to kind of adjust your thinking of, because everybody goes, well, you, uh, you were in the military. I said, I was, but to put it in perspective, Ronald Reagan was actually my commander in chief. <laughs> All right, we were still using wagon wheels and muskets. <laughs> I was telling some young warriors the other day, I was like, they're like, how many times have you been to Iraq? I was like, uh, one, 17 times, I think now. 17 pumps in Iraq or Syria, and all of it was as a missionary doing the fighting. And why shouldn't we? When everybody was watching the TV and seeing people being beheaded, of all people, it should be Christians that run to the sound of gunfire. Christians that should run to chaos to bring order because of the power of God in us. Now make sure you're called to it. You know, <laughs> that's, that's, uh, that's like, uh, and we do some crazy things. We've been to the convention, the AVN National Porn Convention, my wife and I, uh, here in the US. The largest porn convention with all the actors and actresses and and we set up a booth. <laughs> well, why not? I'm going right into the heart of the beast. <laughs> 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 
get you some. It's funny because we were, we were walking through there with her, and uh, my wife had this cute little outfit on with little frills of, what was that, suede, leather? I don't know what that was. And people were like, oh, are they, must be the senior division right there. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> and then today came to our booth, and they're like, what in the world is this? We're playing that video clip. We've got my testimony book out. Uh, and, and they would come up and go, what is this? And of course, they love the dog. And we said, we're trauma specialists and we're here to help anybody who's been struggling emotionally. And they were like, what? Because I mean, booths next to us were selling things and people. And I was like, don't, oh, don't look over there. <laughs> and uh, it was amazing. Because God's spirit moved in darkness. It's, uh, but I say, and some of you men are like, oh, I'll be on that team. Just tell them, when are we going? You better be called to it. Um, but you know, we handed over 2,000 copies of my testimony book out at the National Porn Convention. And, and, you know, we started getting letters from people who were deeply affected by it. So uh, it's, it's time for Christians in these last days, which I believe we're in, it's time for us to stop playing defense and start being aggressive and moving forward and taking ground. If our life and example will inspire you to do something in the realm that God has you in, in the space you're in, then do it. Do it. But I'll tell you, of all people, we as Christians should be a light. We should be the one that are unafraid. If we have God's spirit in us, we should be the one that say, yeah, I don't struggle with porn. I got real quiet right there. I'm saying that's how it should be, and it can. I have a friend, Joshua Broom, who would go to those porn conventions as one of the top celebrated actors in the porn industry. Uh, Joshua Broom, and uh, that's, he's on Instagram. You can follow him. Just, just, <laughs> let, me, let me clarify that. that uh, <laughs> my wife's always tell the rest of the story. Me and him actually did a course you can take online for a buck. It's called Restored, and it's how men can be set free and women from porn. Think about this. He was, he was in the industry, I think, six years, did over 1,000 films, and I think it was twice he was awarded Actor of the Year, the top guy in the industry. And me and him do this course we're just, it's just two men talking about the reality of it all, right? And uh, he explains just how fake it is in detail. I'm laughing my head off. He goes, yeah, there's a guy in the corner eating Doritos. Put the light underneath there. Do that again. Come on. I, you know, it's like, it's nothing what you think it is. They don't know each other. I mean, they're giving shots in places. They keep going. I mean, it's the heartache, the suicide, the addiction it's off the charts. Why would you want to follow that? Not to mention, you're actually increasing the chances for young girls to be abused. And that's what we do in our ministries, protect children and women. That's our main focus. And that's why we went to Iraq. And that's why we went to the porn convention. And that's why we hunt pedophiles. Hey, she's like, she has a patch called the pedophile hunter. <laughs> we travel around that, people are like, I love that patch. And then you see other people like. <laughs> oh, eight years old, she survived cancer last year.
But again, she's one of the few dogs that ever face ISIS, nose to nose, and then kids or women we had rescued, they're actually playing with her and holding her. And any handlers in here, people work with canine units, they, you know, that's a, that's, a, that's a very hard switch. But she's so sweet, and she's my service dog, and she's a therapy dog that bites. <laughs> All right, come on, dog. Come on down. <laughs> we have three of those. I sleep really good at night. <laughs> Somebody tried to break in. I literally can pull out a musket. You know, I'm going to tell you my story tonight, and I want to make sure. How many of you have ever heard my full testimony? Raise your hand. Okay, how many of you have not? Raise your hand. All right, then this is the appropriate message for this audience. Um, I'm not here to trigger anybody because I have a story of abuse and craziness, but I want to encourage people. The scripture that I use is John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. And I wanna talk to you about the whosoever. Whosoever would believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross, you will be saved. I mean, it is a powerful truth. It's like, I just, I'm not sure that we as Western Christians actually understand who Jesus really is. We have an idea, but believe me, God has, been con- God has had to conform to our culture in Christianity in America. Not our culture and the church conform to him. By and large, not here in this church, but I'm telling you, there are churches that people say, I know God, Jesus loves me, And they're living completely contrary to what the Bible says and who God is. I'm like, no, that's not the same God that's in the Bible. You've made him out to be a God to your own desires and lust and twisted way of thinking. We're the ones that have to look at God, his word, and then we have to conform to what he says. Otherwise, you're a false believer. And the Bible says it. Um, eh, There'd be many that call me Lord. But when the day comes, he says, depart from me. I never knew you. I think the church in America is filled with so many non-believing believers. And it is our biggest challenge. Let me tell you something. I was in Iraq, in Mosul, doing a mission to extract a kid, and we had a team with some intel guys, and an associate team brought two guys with them. They were reporters, and from Europe or whatever. So we're in this fob, we're embedded with the Iraqis, and I mean, there's fighting going on. It's, it's pretty intense. And um, the general, uh, General Mustafa, he, he, he looks at the two reporters, he goes, who are y'all? And I had a little weird feeling because you don't move and groove out there without knowing who you're working with because people get their feelings hurt a lot. And the general goes, and I'm watching his bodyguard who's slinging a weapon and he starts tapping his mag. I'm like, oh, here we go. I'll tap my, where is my gun? I better get it. I'm just petting my dog. <laughs> she can keep three men off of my wife trying to touch them. These dogs are six-figure dogs, tier one level trained, 40-year bloodline, start training at five weeks for 14 months, and they never stop training. So the general says, we don't know who you are. We know who you say you are. 
And I never forget, he goes, my men want to kill y'all because they think you're ISIS. And they were European. I was like, this is getting really good. <laughs> Get the popcorn. One of my Terps, who was with Delta, starts uh, politely interrogating them. Give us this, find out, and, and you know, show us online where you did, and I'm just going, oh. And one of them decided to get kind of sassy. And he doesn't know that my Iraqi team member was in Delta and has interrogated thousands because he's just kind of like, bloop, 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 la, la, la. you'd never know it. And next thing you know, I said, well, I've had about enough of this. Present your IDs. Give me your IDs right now. He goes, I ain't got to give you no ID. I was like, click. Oh, thank you. See how easy that was? <laughs> Took pictures, sent them to our intel group. They ran them. Both, one of them was on an ISIS watch list, and the other still had association. That is crazy. You talk about going, ooh. And the general goes, well, um, I think you should leave here now. And, and we, were deep, we were deep inside Mosul. It's fighting over. These are white, European-looking dudes. And they're like, can you give us a ride out? <laughs> the general goes, no. <laughs> I never saw them again. But I'll never forget going, holy smokes, how real did that get? And I'm telling you, there are people in the church that think they're Christians, but they're not. And if that hurts your feelings, it's okay. So, because if all you hear from here only makes you feel good, you're, you're in trouble. You're, you're in real trouble. And, and I'll tell you something, you want him as a lead pastor or anybody to be a pastor, not your friend. Don't be texting and what's your number and can we go get barbecue? It's like, shut up. <laughs> He's a gifted leader. He can't be friends with, yeah, you can't. Oh my gosh. But you should pray for him. I mean, really, every week, y'all should be praying for him and his bride. Because you don't understand the level of spiritual warfare that accompanies a position of a man and a woman leading a church. See, God should love the world, and y'all live in the world, right here in Arizona. There's a lot of darkness over here, which is great. I like one of my heroes as a Marine, Chesty Puller. I, it's, always, it's always good. There you go. Y'all are definitely saved. And uh, <laughs> you'd be guarding the, guarding the pearly gates. Um, Chesty Puller, they were in Korea. They were surrounded by the Chinese. And he had a younger lieutenant say, sir, here's the sit rep. We're surrounded on all sides. There's no way out. And he was starting to feel panicky. And Chesty pulled a salty old Marine. He goes, so they're everywhere, all around us? He's like, yes, sir. He goes, then they've made our job easy. We can shoot in any direction and hit them. <laughs> I love it. Where are the Christians like that? Ah, sinners are everywhere. And you're on a mission from God to be a light to those in darkness. Don't waste your time judging them. I mean, Jesus said, I didn't come to condemn the world. They're already condemned. I came to save them. He's doing a search and rescue. That's the joy of being a Christian. Is there risk? Yeah. Is there danger? Sure. And if you're a believer with God's spirit in you, you will agitate demonic forces in other people. 
Can I talk about demons here? Are we okay? I, I say demon in some churches, and church goes real quiet, like, shh. <laughs> you may wake them up. <laughs> Seriously. I'm like, guess what? They're awake. <laughs> and they're probably hanging out. That's why, Lord, we pray for a seamless canopy of your blood to surround the sanctuary. And those watching... And that nothing will interfere with what you're trying to do here. So I think Christians should have an encounter with somebody manifested demon at least once a year. <laughs> Keep you sharp. Especially you, thick neck. Oh, my dog has that patch. Don't tread. That's what I tell demon. What is? Come here. Listen to me. The demonic world has Christians completely smoked, faked out, that there's something, they have power over you, and they can, uh, please. They're fallen. They're liars. Their dad is the father of lies. It's, it's, he's, that's what he's called in the Bible. He's the father of lies, not the father of scary movies. (laughs) <laughs> Everybody sees him like Kruger, you know. No, no. The whole deal, it's like a bully. It, 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 if you've ever been picked on by a bully, it, once a bully has you in your mind, it doesn't take much to control you. You're just like, Ew. I got picked on as a kid a lot because of my background. And I remember I went to 14 different schools as a kid. All right, every year I'm new. I was a scrawny, sickly kid. My, I think it was my ninth grade year, I weighed 85 pounds, 85 to 90 pounds. I, I, I was sick as a, as a baby, I had to sit in the hospital. And I, and I couldn't fight to save my life. Uh, I was insecure and all that. I, and I remember one time, it was in middle school. We should do away with middle school, just... <laughs> We don't need it. Give a kid a break for a couple of years. <laughs> All right? Uh, or Lord, nowadays, just homeschool your kid. Don't put them in them bastions of... No, oh my gosh, it's totally... But anyway, I got jumped. I got jumped in the locker room. And, you know, I'm trying to fight these guys, and they're laughing. They pound me. And i never forget, they, there was a pole in the middle of the locker room. They spread my legs, and they ran me on that pole. Yeah, uh, so I never forgot that. <laughs> I remember seeing one of them way later in my life. They're like, hey, you grew up. I'm like, yeah, I did. Bullies, they don't back it up. I don't care who they are. ISIS, gang members, I don't, cartels. You, you get a person alone, they don't have the group power. And, and that's what we do to demons. And, and I got, you want to hear some stories? Yeah. Want some demon stories? He's like, yeah. <laughs> I've dealt with demons like my entire Christian life. And it's not because I wanted to. It, it's just something God's called us to. And I'm like, oh my gosh, not another one. And uh, I mean, I literally started praying, Lord, I'm sick of this. Get, I, don't want, I don't want that aspect of ministry. But demons would just pop up everywhere. Hi, I'm like, so God, he showed me how to deal with them. And it's for the purpose of being set free. So I won't use the term possession. I, I just don't use the term possession. That, that denotes ownership. I don't, think a, I don't think a demon can own any human. It, it, to the extent a person's willing to yield themselves to darkness, that's the extent that the demon will have control over you, legally. So there are no victims in this stuff. It's people that yield. And I remember one of the big ones, Christy. So we're in a youth prison, 
You saw me hugging that little boy in the film, right? And we love kids who are incarcerated because I have this extra boldness when preaching to locked up people because they can't leave and they can't come at me. <laughs> I remember I was addressing like one of my first groups and uh, the warden goes, what do you, we assembled them all, but who are you? <laughs> and there's like 75 kids. And, and they were sitting down and it's like, what are, what are you going to talk about? I said, oh, this guy brought me. Ugh, I don't want to. I said, I'm going to do a little martial art thingy. Ugh. And he says, oh, good luck with that. And, uh, and I walk out and all these hard kids are looking at me like, well, you going to talk about white wonder bread? <laughs> and I got out there and I, I did a little demonstration. I do one where, you, did you see where I used the nunchucks to knock some? Yeah. So I had this guy hold pencils in his hand and mouth. And I had been rubbing Bengay on my shoulder. So that should have been a sign that some things you don't need to do. But anyway, I swung, knocked one out too. When I went to hit him in his mouth, the, the pencil, I missed. And I split his chin open. I mean, split him open. He goes, bam. And he staggered. And he leaned forward. He started bleeding. And I didn't know what to do because I'd never like hit anybody accidentally. And I was like, don't move. And then I swung and hit it, knocked it out the second time. He's like, you're crazy. And he's bleeding everywhere. I'm thinking, yes, I am. You have no idea. And instantly I, was, I got mad at God. I was like, well, why this? I shouldn't be here. I didn't want to come here. Now I'm going to have a prison ministry from the inside. This, <laughs> this bites. And let me tell you what, even if you're just trying to do what the Lord tells you to and you blow it, but it's a sincere heart, watch how he redeems stuff. That, that's an amazing thing. He's not out calling you to perfection. He's just saying, just obey me, trust me. And, and all of a sudden I'm like, oh my gosh. And I look out in that crowd of 70, was it 75 kids, right? And they're looking at me. Their whole body posture changed. They went from like this to. <laughs> they're like, this dude's crazy. <laughs> oh, we're going to call him a karate preacher man. And, and I literally got that term. Uh, well, at the end, when I shared my story that I'm about to share with y'all, I, I gave the kids an opportunity to respond, to be forgiven of their sin. To, to have the hope of eternity and to have God's spirit come into them. 53 responded. I, I thought, I literally thought they misunderstood me because I had them raise their hand and then stand. I was like, sit down. Could y'all sit down? I'm like, this doesn't mean you get out. You got to like do your time. This ain't... I literally was like, and I, I, man, I gave the spill again. 53 stood up. Now, this is how I knew we were called to start reaching hard to reach people. Because three months earlier, my wife and I are on a date. Dating is good when you're married. Just make sure it's your wife. <laughs> I think that's where some of us get it mixed up. I determined not to cheat on my wife. Because she's a black belt. <laughs> Karate, jiu-jitsu, national competitor. She was Men's Fitness USA. She can work a blade. She can shoot about anything you put in her hand, small arms to bigger. And she's a precision long rifle shooter. I think her distance right now with a 308 on a Marine Corps sniper rifle is 1,120 yards. So that's the kind where you can run all you want. <laughs> You'll just be tired when she shoots you. So, <laughs> poof. She wasn't killing me, she just kind of winged me. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, stop cheating. Put your effort into your spouse. Give me a break. So, where was I, honey? Yes. She goes, we're on a date night. She's almost full term pregnant, like eight months or something like that. And uh, three months before I go into the youth prison, this is how you know God works, right? He confirms it. And we were at a mall, I think some, I don't know, movie or something. And, and we're leaving. We pull up to this light. Uh, and at the time, I was actually working for Focus on the Family with Dr. James Dobson. Have y'all heard of him? Yeah. yeah. Um, he was my boss for a season, and then he became a mentor, and he's a friend now. I'll be speaking next month for his annual fundraiser event, uh, and, and they just asked me to actually do a series of the, uh, his teachings and his position on manhood. They asked me to, to now represent that as a, a modern-day man in his, so I'm, I'm honored. I just did the first series of videos, and, and, but... Well, at this light, a car pulls up next to us, and it's gang members. And you know, you, I mean, you know when you know. And music's blaring, and that's the kind you just look forward. You put on your worship music louder. Say, <laughs> like, just don't even look there, don't even look there. And then I hear the Holy Spirit prompting. I, I, I'm not great at scriptures. I'm just giving you my personal thing. I, I, I don't remember scriptures great. My kids actually made me a, an ammo belt, which is scriptures that were laminated, hole punch and a big ring. They're like, Dad, carry that around with you because you don't remember much. <laughs> and, and when I'm under attack, I'm like, like mentally under attack, right? I'm like, Mary had a little lamb. Mary had a little lamb. <laughs> and I'm like, Mary, Jesus is a lamb. Is that? Oh. My wife's like, not that one. Uh, I'm like, feed me, give me one. It's, it's, it's seriously like she's throwing me, I'm like, out. She's like giving me scriptures, throwing me a mag. Ha, here we go. Well, my kids, maybe that ammo belt. But, we're, but what I do and have learned, and everybody's different, but I have learned to hear the Holy Spirit really good. And you're talking to somebody who has TBI, traumatic brain injury, Pretty good. I mean, remember the tests, the MRIs, the doctors, the, and they told me, they told me years ago, they're like, Mr. Marks, we know what you do, but you cannot go back overseas. You're, you, you have extensive uh, brain stuff going on. And I was like, is that why fifth grade was the best six years of my life? <laughs> And he's like, it's not a joke. You cannot put yourself under high stress, any more bombing, you've got to just, he goes, I know what you do, we know what you do. It was actually the Amen Clinic, so I went through all that stuff. And, and I looked at him and I, I said, but I'm scheduled to go in two weeks. Because you can't. I said, but the Lord told me to go. So I'm, I'm going. He looks at my wife, he goes, ma'am, he doesn't understand the severity of his injuries with TBI. It's, it's going to get worse. It's going to affect him in ways that will, are absolutely noticeable. And my wife smiled, and he goes, what? I go, she's going with me. <laughs> he was so mad, he, remember, he slammed his board down, he lost his composure. And he walked out. I was like, just give me something to take. No, I said, <laughs> can I smoke marijuana to help it? <laughs> Let me tell you something. I went 11 more times. And by the grace of God, I'm up here before y'all sharing the good news of Christ. Have there been effects of me trusting God? And there has. I do have effects of it. But so what? I'm going to have effects anyway. I could slip off the stage and bump my nose. <laughs> God has ordered our days. And all we're to do is be responsible for the temple he's given us 
do good nutrition, exercise, practice good stress relief, and then push, push, engage. Do what God's called you to do. Whatever lane you're in, business people, make money. Fund ministries. Uh, You're in law enforcement, man, fight the manifestation of evil. Your first response, whatever it is, what, you're a mother, stop competing with TV shows and social media that say mothering isn't a, is not great. It's the greatest job on the face of the earth. Let me tell you. But here we are at this light, and uh, I feel like the Holy Spirit said, tell them about me. And I was like, I rebuked that thought. Right now, I rebuke it, rebuke it. And whenever I struggle, my wife knows. She's like, what? I go, oh, I think God's telling me I should share with them. My wife's like, well, then share. Uh, she rolls down her window. She's pregnant. And then she goes, mm. <laughs> Just like that. And I'm like, woman. I look over. And they're looking at me, I'm like, hi, hi, hi. And I said, I, he, he turns to me and he said, what? I go, pull over. <laughs> and he's like, what? I said, pull over, I want to talk to y'all. And they start laughing. There's a, there's a few of them front and back. They're like, well, man, it's crazy. <laughs> and they turned the music back up and I was like, Lord, your servant was willing, bless me. <laughs> And I get to hear the Holy Spirit say, you can do better than that. <laughs> Use some of that personality I gave you. I was like, oh, bum, bum. Got around and he said, what? I said, pull over. I want to talk to y'all. He goes, I ain't pulling over. And I went, you scared of an old man? <laughs> <laughs> and here I am in our little minivan. <laughs> pull over. I get out, they pile out, it's in a parking lot, and my wife's, you know, here it goes. <laughs> They're coming to me, I'm walking to them, and then I'm literally like, God, what next? I don't know what's next. <laughs> Tell me. And all I could think of, just to create a moment, I said, stop, stop. And they, they paused, and I saw a guy in the back seat had a battle song knife, a butterfly knife. And I said, I saw you had a battle song a knife in the back, and he's like, you a cop? I, I'd never forget, I was like, and in third grade, I was like a cross guard. <laughs> Stop. And I was like, ah, that'd be lying if I, I can't call it. I said, no, but I'm a master of martial arts, and I want to show you how to open and close it the right way. I think they were more shocked about that. <laughs> it's like, what? I said, get the knife. The guy went and got the knife. Because they're illegal. It was a big one. He pulls it out. He comes and there's my wife praying for me. (laughs) He gives it to me. And then I did a demonstration. I flipped it, twirled it. Ah, You know, did a little show. And they're like, what? Then I stabbed the guy. I was like, now. (laughs) Now. (laughs) I'm part of the wealthy older gang. It's arthritis. No, you can't stab people in their neck. It, it hurts a whole witnessing deal. So, so I know, I'm gonna get to it, but I just I haven't talked about that in so long, it's crazy. Uh, so I said, hey, the real reason I pulled you over is that you know I've trained multiple national world champions. Oh, you know, the current national reigning champion is not much older than you. Uh, he's one of my black belts. And I said, I wanna tell you about the true master I serve. His name is Jesus Christ. And then I shared my story. And do you know three of them let me pray for them right there? Right there. See, God knows if you're gonna plant or water, but he's the one that always brings the increase. You just gotta do what he says. Some of you will need to write a check to a ministry that God's saying give, and you may not even know what happens with it until you're in heaven. All I can say is do it. Some of you guys are gonna say, invite somebody. 
Send this link to them. Whatever it is, obey them. Obey them. Ask them, like, can I pray for you? They're like, just ask. I, I, there are times I do that with waitresses. I go, we're going to pray for our food when they bring it to us. We're going to pray for our food. Not that we don't trust the cook, but I mean, <laughs> nowadays. And, and I'm like, is there anything we can pray for you about? You will be surprised on what they say. We've had them just break down and start crying like that. And when you do it sincerity and love, it makes a difference. Well, I was about to wrap it up, and a kid, one of their friends who wasn't in the car, he comes walking up, and he sees me talking to them. He was demonized, and he starts screaming and cussing, and he's cussing against God, and he's cussing against the Bible. That's demon action right there. And he actually starts getting aggressive toward me. I'm like, you better grab that guy. We're going to have a laying on the ministry, laying hands. I don't want rather to, I'd rather not do that right now. It's just going so good. And they're actually physically restraining him. They're like, hey, man, this dude's cool. And he says, don't you tell, you know. And I said, all I was doing was telling my story, how God saved me, pulled me out of darkness. And he goes, don't you, you don't know what type of background I come from. If God loved me, and then I thought, man, yeah, I do. I do know. And when I gave that altar call in that prison three months later and shared the good news of my story, guess who was in that prison? That teenager. And guess who raised his hand and stood to receive Christ? That kid. And I remember asking him as we handed out Bibles, and he, he said, I said, hey, man, you remember me? He's like, yeah. <laughs> I said, I remember you. Look who's in jail. No, you can't. It's not nice. No, that's not good follow-up. Not good. <laughs> I said, can I ask you a question? He's like, yeah. I said, why tonight? Why did you give your life to Christ today? It was the daytime. He said, when you were talking, you said that God, he, he wanted to use our life in a, in a way that he, we, he could live it through us to do things. And he goes, I'm tired of living my life for myself. I was like, that will preach from the mouth of a gang member who surrendered his life. You guys, the story I told them is, is where God brought me from. My father was a drug dealer and a pimp who didn't claim me as this kid. When my mom got pregnant, the night she got pregnant, he put rosary beads down her throat and put a pistol to her head. That's how it was conceived. My mother would go to Mary six times. I went to 14 schools, 17 houses. I grew up horribly insecure. And the main reason is the next man my mom brought into our life who became my stepfather, was a pedophile. And he abused me in all the ways a, a kid should never be abused. Of course, it affected me physically, emotionally, spiritually. And um, I don't like sharing this stuff because I don't want to give darkness any glory. But I've started sharing more lately. Um, I literally was just interviewed on the Sean Ryan show and I shared things I'd never have. And mainly because the abuses and the sexual perversion going on these days is at a whole different level. I mean, kids are not cutting themselves. They're cutting things off themselves. Doctors are prescribing blockers to change them just because they go, I don't feel like I'm a girl or a guy. And it's like, why don't we help them, not hurt them? And you know what's happening right now? A lot are starting to detransition back. Where are the men in our nation that will just stand up and say, no more? I see women doing it, but the men. Women show up to these school board meetings and voice. Let men show up. They're...
there's something about the presence of a man when cowards are making decisions. Let your voice be heard and wait for them out in the parking lot. Say, I'm just here to open the door for you, <laughs> coward. Uh, Jesus wouldn't do that. Peter would. Uh, <laughs> hey, I never wore the ra- I never wore the band. What would Jesus do? But my team, they made me some. <laughs> WWPD. What would Peter do? <laughs> I wore those. I'm, I, I'm, uh, yeah. <laughs> That's why I didn't become a, I, I didn't, I wasn't good in ministry. I don't know if you know this. I, I was on staff at a big, big church, and I was just out of the Marine Corps, and I really, had, I wasn't far along in the sanctification process. <laughs> but they ended up bringing me a guy that I had to counsel. And the short story is he had multiply cheated on his wife. He was smoking crack. And then the third offense, he actually came and his wife called me because I had talked to him before and helped him reconcile. And she said, he just left the house in a rage and our toddler, he punched into the wall. She said, what should I do? I said, call an ambulance and the police. And if he shows up here, I'll take care of the rest. He showed up. And he saw me, and then he wanted another pastor. I was like, oh, no, I got this one. I said, hey, you look perplexed. Come on to the office. I brought him in my office and put him by my, actually behind my desk, and I sat by the door. And I just said, hey, he says, oh, things are bad, things are bad, man. Is there any way you can get me back with my wife? She's upset. I said, I know she's upset. She just called me. And then he went like this. And I said, she told me you, you punched your little child, knocked her against the wall, your toddler. He goes, ah, yeah. And he knew he was called. And he starts crying. I don't know what's wrong with me. I don't know what's wrong with me. He said, maybe I should be beat. I don't have a lot of skill sets, and I'm, <laughs> but there's one I'm really comfortable with. And so I did. I literally went over there, swept him off his feet. So he's like, what are you doing? I said, boom, wow, wow. I just started laying. And all of a sudden, the door bust open, and it's the number two pastor, the older guy. <laughs> he's like, Victor, Victor, he's yelling. I'm like, I'm counseling. I know it sounds crazy, it's, 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 sadly it's really true, just like that. And he goes, Victor, please come out here. I'm like, right, he ain't gonna wear. <laughs> and I'm like, yes sir, what we got? He goes, uh, Victor? And this guy's screaming, call the police, call the police. And I'm like, shut the door. <laughs> he goes, Victor, when, he knew my IQ, he's like, when people come to the church for counseling, <laughs> He's talking real calm. He goes, we, we don't hit them. <laughs> and I was like, I, understand. I know that. I said, I said, we have a waiver because he said he should be beat. So the church is totally safe. <laughs> I literally said that thinking, we're covered. He's like, um... He says, let me handle this, Victor. He's like, could you go down there? I was thinking, yeah, you can probably handle it. He's, so, he's like, I remember walking down the hallway and all these pastors, and they're like looking out of the room. They're like, I'm like, yeah, you can go get some. He's still there. If you... But here I am, where God brought me to be there, and I understand I just had to find the lane that God wanted me to. 
and, and rescuing women and children and hunting pedophiles ended up being one of the biggest initiatives that we have. Two, I mean, just recently, my wife and I left this country, went and rescued a girl in another country, brought her back. And we're still helping her right now. Please pray. Because aftercare is the heart. It's so difficult. But be, my father, he, you know, this guy that abandoned us was a drug dealer, a pimp, and was a practicing warlock. My mother had been abused as a child, so she made very poor decisions with men. I suffered abuse from my stepfather, including being electrocuted multiple times. And the professionals say, well, Victor, we call it torture. It's not just child abuse, it's a level of torture. Where I was dunked in a tub one time until I passed out and then woke up to him breathing into my mouth. And I'm looking up at him as a little kid and he says this, pure evil. He goes, I'm the one that gives you life. Don't ever forget it. He put me in a chair at seven and put a gun to my head, would tap it. And he pulled the hammer back and put his finger on the trigger. And he said, if you ever tell anybody what I've done to you, I'll shoot you and tell the police you found my gun and was playing with it and shot yourself. Seven years old. There's a lot of horrible things that happened to me. But finally, we would escape. We escaped from the house that so much horror had gone on. You know, that stuff messed with me so bad. I had to go into psychiatric care. I had 123 visits to a trauma specialist in nine months. They put me on Depakote, Depakine, Prozac, Zoloft, Lithium, Buspar, there was others. I started drugs in the sixth grade. And never did I ever think I could trust a woman because it was my mother that allowed this into our home. And my mom actually told me as a sixth grader, don't ever trust a woman. She will just use you and leave you. Talk about projecting her own stuff onto me. But guess what? I never dated a girl for more than three months. It wasn't until I met my wife and we got sweet on each other. And we actually sent out our wedding invitations. And three months into being, I mean, really just in love, my emotions stopped and I stopped feeling. I had zero emotions. And when she came to the apartment, she goes, are you okay? I said, I don't feel anything anymore. I can't. She said, you don't feel anything? I said, I have no emotions. It was a survival mechanism. It just distills so from that moment. And I love how God used my wife. I call her my bride, because she was and always has been. And she just said, honey, I'm not your mom. I'm never going to leave you, no matter what. She goes, I know we won't get married right now because you're not in a healthy place to. We'll cancel the wedding. But she goes, I'm not going anywhere. And when you're 85, when we're 85, I'll never forget that. She goes, if you're ready then, then we'll marry. <laughs> My gosh. <laughs> we have... This, this year, we're celebrating 35 years of marriage. So here's the hardest thing I ever had to do because God obviously saved me. It was through my biological dad when I was in the Marines. He sent me a letter, and he apologized for never being there for me. And he said, I know you think I'm crazy because he was in a mental hospital, and my grandfather, his dad, died in the same mental hospital. And you know, sometimes the enemy will just lie to you and say, you don't have a way out. You're going to be just like your daddy or your background or your family. What about my mom's side? My grandfather on my mother's side, I loved him. He was, he was great, but he caught his wife cheating on him. And in a public place, a racetrack, he walked up to her of course, the guy with her started running like a coward, left her there. And my grandfather, under horrible medication, 
Well, it's not right in his head. He pulled out his gun and he shot her. Then he killed himself. That's my background. And my mother would marry some interesting folks. But when God saved me, he cleansed me. When God saved me, he made me whole. And I'll tell you, we're made to heal. No matter what you've gone through. But God will ask you to do some things that you never thought you would, and this is what I'll close with. Out of all the weapons I've used, and I love weapons, the greatest one I've ever used, and and I don't want to lose you when I say it, but listen to me, is a weapon of forgiveness. And God told me, years into marriage, to go find my stepfather that had tortured me. And the first step I did is I went to the house that I hated. And I knocked on that door, and an older lady answered. She said, can I help you? I said, ma'am, I used to live in this house. She said, who's your dad? And I told her, my stepfather. And she goes, I bought this house from him 30 years ago, however much. And she said, bad things happened here, didn't it, young man? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, come here, I want to show you something. I was terrified to even walk in the house, even though it had been redone and it was nice. What it represented was horror to me. I walked into there. She went in the back room and brought out a photograph. She said, I know your family escaped because all y'all stuff was here. It was still here when we bought the house. She goes, so we donated to Goodwill, but she goes, I kept this. And she lays down on the table a picture of me and my brothers and sisters. And she said, I've kept this because God told me to pray for you. And she goes, I've prayed for you all these years. I said, ma'am, God kept you alive so you could see the fruit of your prayers. I said, I'm saved. I follow the Lord, and I just want to thank you for praying for me. I said, that's me, the the blonde-headed one, real cute. (laughs) Highly intelligent one on the... Yes, I'm eating a crayon, but that doesn't matter. (laughs) Future Marine. (laughs) Then what God asked me next was the most... But I could trust him. He said, go find your stepdad and forgive him. And I did. And yeah, it was horrible, it was awkward. And, but guess what? I was in the hospital room with him when he was dying. And uh, I told him straight, I said, Dad, you're going to hell. Based on the Bible, you rejected Jesus. And there's a place that was designed for the angels that fell, but also from people who rebelled against God and you've rejected him all your life. And he goes, he told me, he goes, I I know God can forgive people, but he just didn't think God could forgive him. And the next morning I came in, it was the last day I'd see him. I woke up like at four in the morning, my bride got out of bed with me, and we wept over that man, that God would save him. I can't explain it, it was just supernatural. And when we went in there, he looked at me. This is so personal. He looks at me, and then he turned his head, and he looked at the nurse, and he said, nurse, this is my son. He goes, I'm proud of him. He became kind of like a preacher, which is true, kind (laughs) of. And he goes, he's been worrying about my eternity, but he doesn't have to worry anymore. He said, I made it right with God last night. I knew I was done. I knew why God brought me there. And and she walked out of the room and I just said, Lord, what's the last thing you want me to say to him? And I heard the Lord say, tell him you love him. So I walked over to the bed and said, Dad, I love you. And then he looked at me 
And for the first time in my life, I ever heard these words from a man. He goes, boy, I love you too. I knew I was done. And he didn't have much longer. So I took a pillow. (laughs) What type of people? (laughs) What is going on here? I lifted his neck up. <clears throat> you don't want to die with a stiff neck. That's, that's like horrible. Wow. Hello, generation. I literally walked out, never saw him again. He changed his address. Not only did he get free, but I got free. You guys, my whole story is online. There's a documentary made, and when you walk out, we're gonna give you, I think, some little um, cards. You can watch the movie for free. It's, it's in 15 languages, so. <laughs> God's used it to reach a lot of people. You'll actually see my biological dad on it. And you'll get to see the lady that prayed for me. God kept her alive, and we went to the same house. It's powerful. And trust me, I never used to tell my story until I was like in my 40s. But God is able. The first thing you have to do to experience that is trust him with your life. And God loves you so much that he gave his only begotten son so that you, whoever, would believe in him you could have eternal life. I mean, come on, why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you? If you're a Christian and you're away from God because that's the devil's plan just to suck you away and demons lie to you, man, come back to the Lord. Come back. Live a life that he has planned for you. There's suffering, of course. There's tribulation. But man, I'd rather do it following the Lord especially in these last days. We need you. We need your personality, your giftedness, your quirkiness. We need you in the body of Christ uh, to advance the kingdom of God. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for each person here and for those watching. And it's only by the power of your Holy Spirit, God, do you even draw sinners to repentance. And I pray those you are drawing right now. You said, whosoever would come unto you, Lord, If they would just believe, man, they'd be saved. So if you're here tonight, maybe you were a guest, you were invited, maybe you're a churchgoer, but you realize, oh my goodness, I need to surrender to Jesus. If that's you, can I pray for you right now? If that's you, would you lift your hand up so I can see who you are? Lift your hand up real high. God bless you. God bless you, good. God bless you all. I'm just looking so I can pray for you. Anyone else? God bless you. Good. God bless you, brother. Yes, ma'am, right here in the back. Good. Good. Respond to God's spirit. You know you're hearing from him because he's speaking to you. I see you back there. God bless you. Good. I see you up there. Good. This is why we came. God bless y'all. If you're a believer, but you're like, Victor, I am away from God and I need to come home. I need to be forgiven and cleansed up. And and I just, I want to walk with the Lord moving forward. Would you pray for me? Let me pray for you right now. Lift your hand up real high, wherever you are. God bless y'all. God bless y'all. Good, good, good. God bless you. Good. Ain't nothing you've done that would keep you from him. Trust me. God bless all of you. Good. Praise the Lord. Anyone else? Anyone else? I see you, sweetie. All right, all right, all right, all right. Man, thank you, Lord. Good, I see you on the back, too. Good, I see you on the back. Well, Father, thank you for those that have lifted their hands, indicate their need. And Lord, those that are watching this right now or listening, by the power of your Holy Spirit, would you touch them now and cleanse them, God, as they recognize it's their sin that has separated them from your love, but it's your love. 
that has restored them back to the Father through the cross. So God, I pray that you would save them. I pray that you'd restore them. I pray that you'd renew them that are believers and God, fill them with your spirit in a fresh way. And, and God, for those who need to forgive, those who need to forgive someone right now, I pray you would touch them. They know it is. I pray that they would give up their right to hurt that person back for hurting them. It doesn't mean they'll be reconciled. It doesn't mean justice isn't part of it, but it does mean they will be free. If God just spoke to you about someone you need to forgive, lift your hand real high. God bless y'all. God bless all of you. It's the number one thing in the church is unforgiveness. It'll keep you from a vibrant, free relationship walking with the Lord. Give up your right to hurt that person back and trust God. And just by faith, you say, Lord, I, I forgive them. I choose to forgive them. So Lord, thank you, God, so much for what you did right here, right now, tonight. We love you. We thank you, Jesus. You're the one who loves us and you're the savior of our soul. In Jesus' name, amen.